Hi everyone, Ritz Savell here. Today's educational video will be on a topic that is of interest both to emergency medicine and critical care physicians. Our topic will be that of methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity. I'd like to start out by talking about who you should think about it in. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms of the way the body breaks down both methanol and ethylene glycol because it's important to understand that if you're going to understand the treatment for it, which is of course the most important issue for clinicians. Methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity should be thought about in patients when the situation doesn't quite make sense. If the patient has some sort of inebriation syndrome, but you think it might be more than just ethanol, the concern is in a patient who may have exposure to methanol or ethylene glycol from the history. This can often be quite challenging given the limited history sometimes in patients that have consumed this. Remember that methanol is used in windshield wiper fluid and ethylene glycol is used in antifreeze. They used to describe using ultraviolet light to look for the fluorescein in ethylene glycol, but this is less common these days as certain times that won't be effective. There won't be the fluorescein there. It's important to remember that a fundamental tenet of the treatment for patients like this is that although you will be sending off labs, including an alcohol level, you and you may in fact, if you have a clinical suspicion for methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity, you may send those labs off as well. The focus isn't to wait until those labs are back before you treat. That's simply not the right way to do it. And a common theme in this video will be if the patient, if you have a suspicion that this patient may be suffering from either methanol or ethylene glycol toxicity, start treatment. And so I would begin by sharing with you some of these slides over here where you can see that methanol is broken down into formaldehyde and then formic acid. And it's very important to note here that the enzyme involved in breaking down methanol is alcohol dehydrogenase. This is an absolutely crucial enzyme to understand in terms of the treatment. It's important to understand for both methanol and ethylene glycol that the parent alcohols are not the real culprits here, but rather the metabolites are what cause the real damage. The metabolites for methanol can cause uh, numerous symptoms, but primarily that of visual disturbances. And as you can see on this image, ethylene glycol breaks down into numerous metabolites. And interestingly, uh, as I'll go through, there can be a renal failure component in ethylene glycol metabolism, uh, in ethylene glycol poisoning. And interestingly, the lactate can be very elevated in ethylene glycol poisoning, but it isn't actually due to an elevated lactate, but rather one of the metabolites is read by the machine as lactate. I'd like to spend a moment going over the metabolism here. As you can see, ethylene glycol is broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase. The alcohol dehydrogenase breaks the ethylene glycol down into glycoaldehyde. And then it is broken down here, as you can see, into glycolic acid. The glycolic acid is then turned into glyoxylic acid, and that is then turned into oxalate. The oxalate can bind calcium and form calcium oxalate crystals that can cause renal failure and can actually be seen in the urine. One of the important things to remember when you're managing a patient or even diagnosing a patient with this disease process is to look at the difference between the measured osmolality and the calculated serum osmolality. And that's called the osmolal gap. And if that's greater than 10, then the patient should be thought of as having this disease until proven otherwise. And again, as you'll see in the equation below, the calculated osmolality, two times the sodium, plus BUN divided by 2.8, plus the glucose divided by 18, plus 
alcohol level divided by 3.8 if you've measured an alcohol level and if you calculate the difference between the measured osmolality and the serum osmolality, if that difference is greater than 10, you should be concerned about methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity. And the, one of the main reasons they're lumped together is because their treatment is similar. And the two things to remember are dialysis and fomepazole. Supportive care goes without saying. If these patients need to be intubated to protect their airway, do it. If they need to be resuscitated, if they need vascular access, that needs to be dealt with. But specific treatments include dialysis. Again, if the patients are starting to show evidence of multiple organ failure or evidence of a lactic acidosis, that's very important. Work aggressively with nephrology and have a low threshold to begin dialysis. Again, it's important to remember that the role of famepazole here is to prevent the metabolites from being formed. So it isn't an either or dialysis or famepazole. The idea is to think about this process of a, of a poisoning from methanol or ethylene glycol, that it's the production of these active metabolites that's the real problem, that we want to prevent these metabolites. It is written in medical textbooks to also consider the use of ethanol if fomepazole is not available. We won't be going into the specifics of the dosing of fomepazole here, but that is readily available. And we'd like to conclude by showing you this image. This is uh, an image from an article from a few years ago from the New England Journal of Medicine, just to help summarize some of the issues from this poisoning. As you can see on the left, ethylene glycol which is broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase to glycoaldehyde, which then turns into glycolic acid. The glycolic acid then breaks down into oxalic acid that can bind to calcium, forming calcium oxalate crystals. You can also see here that how it is inhibited, the alcohol dehydrogenase is inhibited by fomepazole. On the right, you can see how methanol is broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase into formaldehyde, which then uh, is broken down into formic acid, which can cause retinal and optic nerve toxicity with the formic acid. So I think the major points that I wanted to share with you from this are a few. One is when you're seeing a patient who may have altered mental status and the story doesn't quite fit, think about that this patient may be it may have been exposed to either accidental or, on purpose, exposure to either methanol or ethylene glycol toxicity. That methanol and ethylene glycol are used in various uh, commercial substances, and that each of them breaks down into various metabolites that can be quite injurious to the body. That you should be measuring quickly the osmolal gap and one other important point is as the uh, disease progresses, the osmolal gap goes down and the anion gap can go up. This is a very important point. And that the treatment for this is aggressively thinking about it, aggressively working with nephrology to consider dialysis and to consider early fomepazole to prevent production of the metabolites that can cause the real damage to the kidney and to the eyes. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this video today.